So in this video, uh, we're going to look at the evidence that it's the phloem uh, vessel that actually uh, transports uh, sucrose. And uh, we're going to have a look at the experimental evidence now that uh, <coughs> backs up a modified uh, mass flow hypothesis. So, um, just to remind you, <coughs> these six points, uh, we've looked at these in, a, in the last video. Uh, these are the six points now that the mass flow hypothesis does not uh, include. So, the experimental evidence we're going to look at in this video uh, is, is to show that these six points uh, actually occur uh, with flow and uh, transport. But first we're going to look at uh, the evidence that the flow and vessel does transport um, sugars and other things as well. So uh, this uh, page is in the notes and um, it's an experiment uh, using radioactive carbon dioxide. So there you can see uh, the radioactive CO2 there with carbon-14. Okay. Um, this setup here is just how the radioactive CO2 is produced. Um, but uh, just, just, just know that radioactive CO2 is used here. So what's happening, we've got a bag around this leaf. Uh, the CO2 is absorbed into the leaf. Um, the leaf will obviously do photosynthesis and the radioactive carbon will be used to make um, sugars and and that radioactive sugar then will be translocated around the plant okay and uh, what you can see here is um, the stem is cut there between points A and B okay and uh, they take a section out of there and uh, that's what this diagram here is it's a drawing of a section through the stem the flow and vessels are on the outer part of the vascular bundle and the xylem uh, inwards so on top of that is placed a photographic film and that photographic film is sensitive to radioactivity and uh, it'll produce a fogging wherever there is uh, radioactivity. So in this diagram here, you can just about see that uh, where the flow and vessels are, you have fogging, and that tells us that radioactive carbon is found in those flow and vessels. And uh, because that radioactive carbon is, is uh, in the form of the sucrose, it shows that phloem translocates uh, sucrose there. So that's uh, one um, piece of experimental evidence to prove it's the phloem that is transporting uh, the sugars. Okay, the next piece of evidence that phloem does the transporting of sugars uh, is called the ringing uh, experiment. Um, with this experiment, um, you remove, um, if we go to this uh, real picture here of a, a tree trunk, uh, you actually remove the bark layer and you also remove the layer containing the flow and vessels. All right, so this region here uh, has no flow and it's been totally removed. So just to show you with this diagram here, that's the uh, the tissue there that's being uh, removed. Okay, so the whole of the flow and vessels all the way around the trunk and the bark are removed. Okay, so hence it looks like a ring and that's why it's called the ringing uh, experiment. Uh, this diagram here is uh, obviously a drawing of the ringing experiment. So this, um, this diagram here shows the starting point.
point of the experiment where the ring has just been created and then over uh, quite a long time you get uh, accumulation uh, occurring um, above the ring so what's happening there is the um, uh, the sucrose uh, cannot travel any further down the trunk because the flow and vessels have been removed so this is evidence now that the flow and vessel is um, transporting uh, sugars uh, the other thing that happens is uh, the, the the plant the tree will eventually die when you do this experiment so it's it's not done so much these days uh, and the reason being is uh, you don't get any sugars or any other substances um, go into the roots okay so the roots would be down here and uh, they'll they'll have uh, no access then to uh, sugars and amino acids and so on uh, what does happen however is that water can still flow up uh, the uh, up and past the ring region because these island vessels are left in place as you can see on this uh, diagram here so the inner uh, part of the vascular bundle is the xylem vessel so they remain so water does travel through the plant but um, no um, no sucrose uh, not not past the ring region anyway okay uh, so that's the ringing experiment okay thirdly then um, is the uh, the use of aphids um, now these uh, animals um, uh, are also called green fly uh, but they feed um, off plants and they they extract the liquid out of the flow and vessels uh, so they're a they're a really useful animal in investigating the uh, the flow and transport so these ima images here are of real uh, aphids okay so this is what they look like uh, in real life uh, here is a drawing uh, of an aphid and how it is able to actually tap into the flow and vessels. So what it's got is uh, a feeding tube called a stylet. Okay, and that can go all the way through the tissues of the plant and then enter the sieve tube elements of the flow and so the the use of aphids uh, allows access to the flow and vessel and the ability to actually analyze uh, what is in the flow and vessel itself okay so that's what this top uh, drawing is showing you here uh, the bottom one um, <clears throat> in order to sample the fluid in the flow and you do have to remove the uh, the aphid and uh, keep the uh, stylet in place and you can see here in yellow that the sap or fluid in the flow and vessel then starts exuding or uh, dripping out of the um, stylet um, that will allow then scientists to analyze what's actually in the flow and vessel okay um so again you could have radioactive co2 and that will make radioactive sucrose and you could detect radioactivity in that sap again um so that's what that middle diagram uh, is showing uh the far right now um this again is a real aphid and this just shows the real stylet uh here uh, running into the phloem vessels here so that P is the phloem vessel and there's the uh, stylet going through right down into the phloem vessels and this last image here uh, again just shows the um, the uh, phloem sap uh, exuding from the cut part of the stylet so the stylet is there okay and then that's the fluid uh, dripping out so uh, aphids um, 
have been used a lot to study uh, the flow of vessel and there are various experiments that use aphids to, to uh, figure out other things about flow and transport that we'll uh, cover later. So, so far we've looked at the evidence to prove that it's the flow and vessels that transports uh, sugars. The next part uh, we're going to look at um, other factors now that um, have, pr have shown to happen in flow and transport that have not been part of the mass flow hypothesis. Okay, uh, on the next slide we're going to look at uh, evidence now for the role of the companion cell, uh, the need uh, for ATP and that the hydrostatic pressure is created in the flow of itself. So we're going to look at evidence for number one, number four and uh, number five. So um, this is the drawing in the notes. Now uh, there's lots uh, going on in this drawing so I want to go through it slowly and make sure you understand each each part. Um, but what this, this diagram is actually showing is something called uh, sucrose loading. And uh, it's this sucrose loading that uh, requires ATP. It needs the companion cell and it will ultimately lead to a, a, a high pressure within the, uh, the flow um, vessel. Okay, so just to remind you um, of the structure of the leaf, uh, which is here, just to know that uh, point number two are the palisade mesophyll cells where photosynthesis occurs. And down here at number eight are the phloem uh, vessels within the vascular bundle. And uh, the sugars that are made in the palisade mesophyll cells have to get uh, into those phloem vessels. And that's what this diagram down here uh, is trying to uh, show. And I hope to be able to explain it as well now. So um, what we have here is the palisade mesophyll cells. And uh, in the chloroplasts, uh, there will be photosynthesis and they will be producing sugars or sucrose. OK, so the sucrose is going to dissolve in water. And uh, because it's dissolved in water, it can move through the palisade mesophyll cells uh, via the apoplast pathway, which is through the cell walls, which is here. So that's the apoplast. And um, it can also travel in the cytoplasm uh, through the plasmodesmata, which is here. So that's known as the uh, symplast uh, pathway. OK, so um, that uh, black arrow there really represents the movement of sugars in water through the symplast and apoplast pathways. OK, so uh, when the sugars move and they come to the palisade cells that are in contact with the companion cell, this is where the phloem uh, loading uh, occurs. OK, so this uh, second palisade cell represents the the last one, really, um, that is in contact with the companion cell. So what we have to do is we've got to get uh, the sucrose, which is here into the companion cell, i.e. Uh, 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 sucrose loading. So to do that, we need to create um, a gradient. And the gradient that we create is a proton gradient uh, or hydrogen ion gradient. So you can see here, there's a hydrogen ion and it's being pumped from the companion cell into that mesophyll cell. Now that movement is against the gradient. 
so it requires ATP and this is why flow and transport requires ATP it's there to actually make or generate this proton uh, gradient. So the concentration of protons in the palisade cell is high and in the uh, companion cell it's low. All right, so that's why it has to be actively transported against the gradient. So that um, proton gradient is going to be used to transport sucrose into the companion cell. So what we have here uh, in light blue is a proton sucrose co-transport protein where it can transport uh, both protons and the sucrose together into the companion cell and the movement is down the proton uh, gradient. So that's what's happening here with this co-transport protein. So the, the sucrose uh, is um, moves in, it's facilitated diffusion, okay, into the companion cell. Uh, the sucrose remains in the companion cell for the moment, and the protons are re-pumped out, okay. So they are pumped out to actually maintain the gradient uh, between the palisade cell and the companion cell. Right, to the uh, sucrose now. So all this sucrose is uh, accumulating in the companion cell and it's going to lower the water potential. And that is going to cause water from the xylem vessels up here. Water is going to enter the companion cell. Okay, now that water um, will then transport uh, the sugars through the plasmodesmata here and into the phloem vessel. Okay, so those three sweeping arrows represent uh, movement of water with sucrose in into the phloem vessel. Okay, so we've lo loaded uh, sucrose into the companion cell and now it moves into the phloem. And once in the phloem, you can see that you get um, lots of sucrose, lots of water entering that phloem vessel. And here you get your high uh, pressure. Okay, and that high pressure will then move or push the uh, sucrose and the water uh, through the flowing vessels via the uh, the pores in the sieve plate. So there's the need for ATP, the function of the companion cell and that the pressure is actually generated within the flowing vessel and not the palisade mesophyll cells. Okay, hopefully that made uh, some sense for everyone. So, in the remaining slides, uh, we're now going to look at the function of the sieve plates. Okay, and um, we're going to look at uh, bidirectional movement seen in the phloem, and uh, that the translocation occurs at uh, different uh, velocities. Uh, we'll also look at uh, an additional uh, theory of um, flow and movement. It's, uh, it's linked with bidirectional movement. It's called uh, cytoplasmic streaming. All right, so that's another little piece of evidence that uh, supports bidirectional movement. So um, they're the remaining three uh, points that we need to look at. Okay, so um, this page shows uh, two uh, pieces of evidence uh, to support bidirectional uh, movement. Um, with image number one, uh, we've got a, a plant, uh, or a drawing that represents a plant, 
where all of the leaves have been removed apart from just one leaf that's uh, near the center of the stem okay so the leaf is uh, put into a plastic bag you add radioactive co2 and again like we said earlier in the video uh, the leaf will photosynthesize and make uh, radioactive uh, sucrose so when that is transported um, in the leaf uh, around the plant sorry we can actually detect that radioactivity will be found right at the top of the plant and also right at the bottom of the plant actually in the roots so this is evidence to suggest well the sucrose is only coming from that central leaf if it only moved in one direction we'd only have radioactivity in one part of the plant <clears throat> but we don't we see it uh, throughout the plant so that is evidence to show that there is bi-directional movement uh, within the plant very old classic experiment this uh, this is based on okay um, image number two is of the flow and vessel okay and um, what has been seen is uh, protein filaments that span from one sieve plate to another and they actually go uh, the, these protein filaments actually go through the pores in the sieve plate now it's suggested that these protein filaments can transport uh, substances so if that red dot represents sucrose for example it could be transported that way down one filament but on another one it could be transported the other way so this uh, this is thought to happen and is evidence that you can get bi-directional movement um through the sieve plate so this is what the sieve plate is for is to allow these protein filaments to span through and you can get bi-directional movement within one single flow and vessel okay now if i go back to image one um this this evidence if i draw quickly that's a flow and vessel uh this is another one uh, what can be happening here is you could get movement up in one flow and vessel and movement down in a separate flow and vessel. So we don't exactly know what's happening here, whether the movement is in two separate flow and vessels or one single vessel. This image, image number two, shows that it's possible to get bi-directional movement in a single flow and vessel okay so this is um, two pieces of evidence that support bi-directional movement which can be in separate flow and vessels or can occur in the same flow and vessel okay so the next slide now um, is going to show um cytoplasmic streaming okay so the um orangey region there is that uh, very narrow thin cytoplasm layer that's found in the uh, sieve tube elements and uh, like like all cytoplasms the you can see this phenomena called cytoplasmic streaming and uh, all it is is that the actual cytoplasm is moving and uh, when it moves certainly in the phloem vessels it's thought to actually move substances through uh, the sieve tube elements okay so the black arrows represent the streaming of the cytoplasm and if you look between neighboring sieve tube elements you can see the the streaming is sort of anti-parallel okay so it's that streaming that uh, is thought to allow substances to move through the uh, the pore of the sieve plate
OK, so this is uh, what we call an alternative theory to uh, flow um, movement. It's called cytoplasmic uh, streaming. Right, um, the last uh, part now is to do with uh, the velocity, the speed um, that translocation uh, occurs at. So this uh, is another way of using aphids. OK, so you can have a plant again. Uh, all of the leaves are taken off apart from one. Uh, this time the leaf is um, further down to the base of the stem. But you use radioactive CO2 again to, to make your radioactive sucrose. And what you can do is that the positions A and B of the aphids, what you can do is you can sample the sap coming out of the, uh, the stylet of the aphid. And uh, when you detect radioactivity in A, you start a stop clock and then you time how long it takes to detect radioactivity in uh, aphid B. Uh, so if you've got the time, um, then you know the distance. Rid of that. So if you know the time and you know the distance between the aphids, you can divide uh, wrong way around. You can divide distance by time and that will give you uh, the speed or the velocity. So using this experiment, it's been shown that the translocation speed is variable. Uh, it can be fast sometimes, slow other times. But uh, it's also been discovered that it's uh, far faster than what can be accounted for by the mass flow hypothesis. Because the mass flow hypothesis uh, relies on this pressure gradient between the source and the sink, uh, that pressure gradient doesn't really change. So the velocity doesn't change, it's constant. But this experiment shows that the velocity does change and it's higher than what can be accounted for by the mass flow hypothesis. Right, OK, so that's uh, that's the last slide on this video. Hopefully this section of the notes makes a little bit more sense for everyone.